So about a year ago, I had what felt like um, a profound revelation, and as often happens when I feel profound revelations coming, I get in front of a keyboard and fire up Twitter and write it in there. Um, and what this revelation was, uh, was the following, is that the distinction between internet and books is arbitrary and is going to disappear in five years or three years or two years or one year, something like that. Start adjusting now. It seems maybe trivial uh, to me now, um, but still there was something, excuse me, um, there was something really profoundly uh, clear to me that, that, that there's a very big distinction that, that people make, um, that certain kinds of words and sentences go into books, and we can do certain kinds of things with books, and other kinds of words and sentences uh, go into the internet. And we can do different kinds of things with those words and sentences. And I think that idea resonates with a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. And at the heart, I think, is a uh, sentiment that was expressed by uh, a fellow Twitterer who said um, that indeed no books in the internet aren't going to, uh, that there is a distinction between books and the internet because books are researched, written, edited, published, and marketed, and hence paid for, whereas the internet is ego and noise, and hence free. And so there's this sort of sense that we have um, that there are certain kinds of things that get printed on pages, um, bound between covers and sent to bookstores, bought by serious people and read by candlelight or uh, quietly in the library. Um, whereas other kinds of words and sentences get typed up um, on keyboards and sent out to screens and uh, computers and smartphones around the world. And I call this the Joyce cheeseburger <laughs> dichotomy. Um, the idea that important words and sentences should go into books, whereas celebrity gossip, uh, twittering about what you had for lunch, and Facebook pictures of uh, drunken escapades should go on the internet. But it's actually demonstrably false, this notion that the internet is filled with stupid stuff. In fact, the first website on the World Wide Web was Project Gutenberg, which uh, has been collecting and disseminating free versions, free electronic versions of the world's greatest books uh, since 1971. But it's worth asking why it is uh, that given that Project Gutenberg has been around since the earliest days of the internet, that at least for general, the general reading population, um, we haven't seen a large embrace of reading on screens until very recently. And I think the reason is, is pretty clear. It has to do with technology and a couple of marketing giants that got behind some new and great technology, one of them being Amazon and their new Kindle, which came out in 2007. And coincidentally, uh, the other one is the iPhone, which came out in 2007 as well, pushed by Apple, of course. And if you can believe it, the first ebook that I read was War and Peace, which I read in its entirety uh, on the iPhone. And when I finished this thing, which had been um, lording over me for many years unread, um, and I read it on my iPhone, I thought, okay, ebooks are, are here to stay. And indeed, they are here uh, in force. Um, in 2008, maybe 1% of the trade market in the US, so the regular books that you and I would buy in a bookstore uh, were ebooks, and I think it was probably even less than that. Uh, by last year, that number was up to 20%, and we expect to see something like 50% uh, ebook sales uh, by 2015. And what's kind of amazing in this whole process is that even though we've seen this massive shift in technology, the actual process. Um, that happens around the dissemination of books and, in fact, the reading of it. Uh, the structures there haven't changed all that much. So we still have publishers and writers, and they uh, write a book, and that gets turned into an electronic file instead of a print file, or in addition to a print file, uh, or a, a, a print book, um, sent to a distributor or directly to a retailer, uh, so a bookstore like Amazon, 
Um, they sell the book, which gets downloaded by someone, they read it, and then they go back to the bookstore and, and uh, download another book and buy another one. But what's interesting about this is that ebooks are very different from print books. And in fact, what they're a lot more similar to is websites. Um, it turns out that ebooks are just made of HTML, which is the programming language or the markup language that drives the internet. And it makes sense because all books are, are collections of words and sentences with a certain structure and maybe some metadata and uh, cover image and an author bio, et cetera. Um, so it makes sense since we've been making these kinds of structured collections of text available as websites for many, many years that we would use the same kinds of technologies to make ebooks. But of course, there's a terror here and a catch. And that's that publishers are deathly afraid of the internet. And in a way, they have very good reason to be afraid of the internet because the internet is famous for gobbling up business models and spitting out total chaos. <laughs> but it hasn't been so bad yet because ebooks look pretty similar to books in terms of the structure of the business and, and what we can do with them. And that really, I think, is a problem. And it's a problem because in order to get this similarity with the past, we've ended up constraining ebooks and making them look a lot more like print books and a lot less like the internet. So there are all sorts of things you can do with a website or information that's on a website that you can't do with ebooks. You can't link to a canonical version of an ebook. You can't link to a specific chapter, a specific page. Uh, you usually can't copy and paste. Um, you can't even leave a comment in a central place. So these kind of fundamental um, interactions that we have with information on the internet, which have uh, enriched, I think, our information lives in great ways, are, are blocked and constrained in ebooks to date. Um, and so this poses a question to all of you as readers. And the question is this. Um, would you have more value if books were available in print and ebooks and a web version? Or if you just had print and ebooks? And my answer, just by looking at the straight mathematics, is that there's more value with P plus E plus W than there is with just two or one of those possibilities. And I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's a novelist, and, and he was remarking about how you do a, a, this is just this morning as I had already delivered my deck uh, to the TEDx people. And he said, you know, the most important thing is to finish the story. And I realized that in my deck and in my, what I had prepared, I had left the rest of this open to the question mark of what we could do with books on the internet. Um, and I wasn't going to answer that question. Um, so I'm going off script a little bit. And I just want to give a couple of examples of what I mean by this value that we might start thinking about with books um, if we start seeing them on the web. Um, and I don't have any slides to illustrate this because this is a brand new addition to my talk today. Um, so one is, is a, a website and app and book. Um, I think you would have heard of the Bible. Um, and it's an app called Uversion, um, and I think the Bible app on the iPhone. And Uversion is the website. And this is the most amazing thing. It's been around since 2007, I think. And what they've done is, uh, in all digital versions of this Bible, which includes a web version, a multi-platform ebook version, which is on all um, platforms, whether it's BlackBerry, Android, iOS, um, every single phrase, every single uh, sentence in that Bible is translatable, A, into, I think they have 70 different versions that you can translate it into. But every single version that every reader has can be commented upon. And so you can open that up and see the comment of every single person who's taken a look at that verse in the Bible. It's a very powerful thing to think about all the millions of people. I think they have something like 70 million people have downloaded their app. 
all of them interacting with something that goes into a central place where everyone can see what those interactions are. Um, the second example is a friend of mine who's in the process of building a web version of Robert Scott's journal. So Robert Scott, the most famous silver medalist in the history of the universe, maybe, um, who reached the South Pole, I think it was two days after um, someone else had already gotten there. Um, and so he has this amazing journal written uh, in, the, I believe that expedition was in uh, 1912, 1913. Um, it's filled with the people, the places, the dates. And they've taken that journal, which exists as a fascinating document and a fascinating print book, uh, which is available as an e-book as well, but they've turned it into a beautiful web experience where every single photograph, every single person, every single date, is tied together and tied to Google Maps or Google Earth. So you can chart the course of that entire journey and see everything that's happened along the way um, and every bit of data that we have, uh, pictures of different uh, implements used at different times uh, connected to this one experience. Um, so those are two clear ideas of what you could do with books on the internet. And I think the important thing is that um, we don't know. We don't know because the internet is this wide open place where amazing things happen when we start to put data onto it. And we never really could have imagined um, email, what email did to mail, what Twitter did to conversation, what uh, we were talking earlier, Jake was talking earlier about maps and what happened when you put Google Maps on the web. Um, so if you think about books, uh, as great data sets that could be um, explored in new ways by people once they were opened up on the web. It starts to be very exciting. And I think um, you know, the question of why this is going to happen is just about a question of um, evolution and innovation. And when you throw m great piles of data and interesting stuff at people, they start building innovation and creativity and thinking of new ways to do exciting and valuable things with books. So, um, of course, there are probably a number of you out there thinking this is heretical. Um, books aren't going to end up on the web because the web, of course, is filled with ego and noise, whereas books are for serious things. But um, I guess I would leave just with this idea that, that the future of what we do once we start to put books in this connected network world is totally open, and that's a very exciting thing for people who love books and who love the web to start dreaming about. Thank you very much.